Well, when it was the fort days, um, they abolished all ceremonies, all ceremonies, and even as far as talking the language. Of course, it was because they were trying to assimilate, and they were pretty harsh about it. Um, the uh, what they might call the superintendent or the the uh, uh, commissioner, the Indian commissioner for the reservation. He was like the all rules, and he was getting his rules from Washington. So they made it to where that they didn't want him to practice anymore and try to assimilate him to uh, being uh, farmers, which wasn't that bad for us because we were already farmers. We, we didn't go very far. Um, we lived along the Bismarck area here and went up along the river up north up to uh, the Staten area, uh, up to the, the Knife River. Um, where we're at today, that's new ground for us, pretty close, you know. So when they put us on the Indian Reservation of Fort Berthold, Everybody pretty much was right around the area of um, like a fishhook village. And I'm talking about the Hiradzas and the Mandans and the Rikaras. The Mandans call themselves the Nuwata and the Rikaras call themselves Sanish. And Hiradzas, that's what we call ourselves. Um, they put us into little districts over there along the river, and they were called, uh, Elba Woods was kind of like the capital, like Bismarck is, you know. So Elba Woods had the day school and the governmental things that were there. And then there was different communities like Nishu and Lucky Mound, uh, Shaw Creek, Independence, um, Charging Eagle, and those were the different communities that were on the reservation. The Mandans kind of stayed more on the the west side of the river, and the Rikaras more at least stayed on the east side of the river, and Hidajas were kind of on both sides. And there was a group of Hiradzis and a few Mandans and a few Rikaras that didn't like what was being forced on them. So they left and they went north along the Missouri River up just past the mouth of the uh, Yellowtail River and that's the river that flows all the way into Crow Country along Sydney, Montana and Fairview and down that way to Crow or Billings area. And uh, there was uh, two forts up there by Williston. Williston wasn't there yet. There's two forts over there called uh, Buford, Fort Buford and Fort Union. And the Hiraz is kind of camped in between them, which was close to the, the mouth of the Yellowstone. And uh, The reason why they left it, like I said, there was, there was, a ban uh, they were to abandon all customs and language and traditions and customs. And it was about maybe, almost maybe 30 years that they were gone. And they say that the language changed a little bit, the Hiraja language. Today we have two dialects because of that. So when they left, they took with them everything. They, they practiced everything all those years that they were gone. And they, it was strong. They knew. They knew what they were supposed to do. They knew how to live their lives. Uh, like I was saying, uh, everyday living, belief ways. That's how they were. From the time they woke up until they laid down, they were 
they did those things that they, they were accustomed to. Well, back here on Fort Berthel, because of the, the harsh assimilation and the, uh, they kept the people at bay, um, you had to ask to be married to the commissioner. You had to ask to do a giveaway. You had to write a list of what you wanted to give away to who you wanted to give it to. Um, they weren't allowed to speak their languages in the schools. Um, just a lot of hardship and change. That was the biggest thing was change to the people. And those Khoshkas, that's what we are, Chalkrik people, our Khoshkas. They were gone and they lived that lifestyle for that many years and they wanted to start their own reservation over there. They wanted to start their own area over there. And the government said no, that they would have to come home. And they tried to negotiate. We had scouts among them that worked for the army. They used to run mail all the way to Fort Totten, all the way down to Fort Stevenson, to Fort Berthold. They would run mail. <clears throat> so we had scouts and, you know, we were still semi-simulated, but they practiced their, their ways. So when they brought them back, it was like a trail of tears, our own trail of tears. They brought them back, it was in March of uh, 1896. And there was still ice on the, on, the, on the river. And a lot of them walked because they didn't want to come back. So they had to bring back, they, they put the horses, the, the unroped or unrode horses in the front to break the trail. And then they wagoned them. The ones that rode wagon and the rest walked back. <clears throat> a lot of babies and old people left. It was pretty hard, hard winter yet. And we talked about that earlier today. It was about historical grief and how, how it still hurts. You know, I'm... 120 some odd years and it still hurts. My grandpa was born when they got home. My mom's dad. My children's relatives, they have a grandpa on that side named Stephen Bird. He lived to be about 106 or 7 years old and passed away in 1983. So those stories are not that old. You know, there's still there's still real young stories that were told about how they came home. And once they, you know, the ones that lived here on the reservation had to go underground to perform what they had left, whether it would be ceremonies, namings, marriage, uh, adoptions into clans. Mm healing ceremonies, all that had to be done at night <laughs> or hidden away from them. So when the Hiradza came back, the Khushkas came back along with the few Mandan that went with them and the few Rikra that went with them. What they had was strong and they went underground with them to keep that alive, to keep that going. And it wasn't until the, uh, I don't remember what name of that act was, the Native American Religious Freedom Act of 1976, I believe it was. That's when they came out and they start performing all these things like sun dances and, well, Okipas, Okipas man dance, kind of their sun dance. Um, when I was a boy, I don't remember sun dances. I was born in 1964, which is not that long ago. 
but I don't remember seeing sun dances. Today there's lots of sun dances all summer long. Um, I myself am not a sun dancer. I don't. Um, Pawos, you know, Pawos went, you even had to ask to dance, you know, back then. Now we just get a committee together and we have a good time of doings. And those doings, those dances, that's where it's strong customs that we did practice the namings because we did things in public. We gave names, we gave, we adopted people into our family and clans. Um, somebody did good deeds or came back from the military, we, we honored them, you know, those kinds of things. It wasn't about prize money or contest money or singing money. You know, it was about those kinds of things. That's what I remember. And I'm, I'm a young, I, I do a lot of announcing today at the Powell's and I, I kind of say that once in a while. I kind of get off on the tangent once in a while and Sunday afternoon it gets hot and now I'll say, well, it used to be this way or things were done this way. And it's just good to hear those things that I, that I learned from old people and I'd like to see it continue, but change is always inevitable and it's always going to be hard but you know it's it's changing it's things are done a little bit different today than when i was younger